Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we have another interview with Dr. Novik to talk about facial rejuvenation and liquid facelifts, facelifts and all the other things related to aging. So if you want to know more about it and his opinion on, on different treatments, make sure you watch the video. And again, if you like it, give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and I hope you enjoy the interview. Thank you so much for watching. Bye. Hello everyone, welcome back. And today we have a Dr. Novik back to talk about uh, facial rejuvenation. Uh, thank you so much again, uh, Dr. Novik, for joining and sharing more uh, of your knowledge uh, with us. So I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Let's jump right in. And I already have the first question uh, regarding facial rejuvenation. And uh, if you could explain to us, what are uh, liquid facelifts and why um, they're so uh, <laughs> important and, and growing today? Yeah, liquid facelifts are basically like a, a term that patient, that people use. You know, it's a consumer term for for a non-surgical approach whereby you're not using any cutting or stitches. You're basically doing something non-surgically using injectables, which use, which typically come in liquid form. And so that's that's the common term now is a liquid facelift. Perfect. And, and we have the liquid ones. And, uh, but actually the, the, the second one that I wanted to ask you, uh, just, let's just follow what we, <laughs> what we uh, talked previously was what really happens when we age, because we, we look for rejuvenation as we, we get older, right? So what, what is actually happening to the skin as we age? Yeah, that, that's the, that's the critical, that's the critical issue of why liquid facelifts, non-surgical facelifts, play such an amazing role because it was only in the past 15 plus years that we really understood the anatomy of what's going on with aging. So we basically did a complete turnaround in our approach to what anti-aging is. So first we have to know what happens when we age. Okay. There, you have to imagine that the, imagine that the tissues of the face are really more than one layer. There's the outer layer, the fabric of the skin, that's what we see on the outside, but we have all the tissues underneath, which are the supportive framework of the face. So imagine that the skin is like the is like a building, a house, but the foundation of the house is underneath, and that foundation is critical. Mm -hmm. So what happens basically to that foundation is something that we learned only in the past about uh, fifteen or so years when we started to study it actively. Okay, so we have underneath our skin, we have, we have a series of fat pads. We have fat pads in the cheeks, along the jawline, in the temple area. We have muscle underneath and we have bone. Those are the, and we have ligaments, which are fibrous bands, which hold, you know, which hold the, the layers in, in, in proper position. Okay, so what happens is we, as we age uh, is that the fat pads in particular shrink and shrivel with time. The bone, we have bone loss in the cheeks, around the orbits, around the jaw, and we have some loss in muscle mass as well. Now, think about this. We have this fabric of skin sitting over these massive tissues I've just mentioned, and everything is hunky-dory while a person is, is uh, you know, young. Everything's in its pro appropriate place. Now, let's, let's take just one of the many fat pads in, in the face and let's discuss what happened. There's a very critical fat pad which starts at the bony portion that I'm pointing to of the face and sort of swings down in a kind of like lamb chop style shape or, or triangular shape into the cheek. Now imagine, now everything is fine and hold, it's holding things up, you know, in, in youth. Now, as a person passes 30, 35, 40, 45, that fat, just that fat fat, let's concentrate, shrinks and shrivels. So it becomes much thinner and much weaker. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, gravity now can grab a hold of that, of the remnant of that fat fat, and it's pulled downward and inward. So that what now this remnant of the fat fat is sitting in an abnormal location, Pressing on the smile on this smile area, creating the smile fold. There's a pressure somewhat downward, helping to contribute to the marionette line, the Howdy Doody line. 
and there's a pressure straight downward, which leads to that the jowl along the jawline. So now, if you add to it that there's, there can be bone loss in the cheek area, as well as some fat, uh, as, as well as some muscular loss, this downward and inward pressure in this area becomes even more accentuated. Mm -hmm. And so people in general, and doctors up until about 15 years ago also, saw this as simple laxity of the skin, when in reality, it was, it was the tissue underneath, the tissues underneath, like the fat, the bone, to some degree, the muscle, that was contributing towards, towards this change in shape. So imagine what happens just from this change in shape. Here in youth, you had the fat pad all the way up sitting over this bone of the cheek. Now the remnant is down here like this. Everything mm -hmm. has come down so that the bottom of the face now has become box shape instead of like the more ideal heart shape that particularly women like. Now, even in men, there's a change because, because of this. It's, it, it, it can be a little bit less accentuated, but there can be loss in, in a certain area in towards the central portion. So there's flattening and there's loss of shape in men, which also was attributed to laxity. But what happens is it wasn't. Now there's another factor that goes on and this will play into when we discuss again, liquid facelifts. Um, the, the muscles of facial expression for reasons which are not completely explained at e even now, because, and opposed to any other voluntary muscles of the body, which we know become more lax. And, you know, well, as you get older, you have to exercise more and everything. But the point is the muscles of facial expression become somewhat overactive with the passage of time. So now picture this, this scenario. The muscles of the face are becoming more, more hyperactive with, with age. So that when you were five years old and you smiled, you smiled and you went back to normal when you stopped smiling. But now, as a person ages, when they when the muscle, when the muscle contracts, it contracts even more vigorously than it did when you the, the person was much younger. And it goes boom like this, it tightens. And this happens at a time when in the fabric of the skin, the actual skin that you see has, has, has lost its, the quantity and quality of the collagen and elastic fibers and dermal matrix. Mm -hmm. And it's lost it because 90% of the time from excessive chronic sun exposure and 10% of the time from genetics, from gravity, uh, from the way you sleep lines. But what happens is the fabric of the skin has been damaged with the quality and the quantity of the collagen elastic fibers and, and the matrix, the gelatin matrix that holds those fibers has, has diminished and has become less functional, less hydrated. Now the person smiles, but the muscles are now overactive and the counter force provided by the fabric of the skin is so much less so that when we smile hard, we get crow's feet on the side. When we scowl down and frown at somebody, we get deep 11 lines. When we raise up our eyebrows, we get, we get the, the horizontal worry line. Now think about this. When you do this, see, wait, if, if, if you take a flat piece of paper, you know, piece of uh, a regular piece of printing paper that has no lines on it, no crinkles, and you just fold it just once really well, and you open it up, everybody knows there's gonna be a crease mark on that, on that white page. Even if you went over it with a hot iron, it would still show that crease mark. Yeah. Now imagine what happens to a person's face when they make those creases, those expressions, those, those movement expressions a thousand, two thousand times a day on fabric, which is no longer which has been which has been sun beaten or chronologically aged or sleep line and they're folding it a thousand to two thousand times a day that when you open it up they now have crow's feet when they're not smiling they have worry lines when they're not raising their eyes without and they and they have and they have a, they have 11 lines without scowling 
So you have crow's feet, worries lines, 11 lines, all sitting there at rest. At rest. So here's where, here's where, you know, here's where liquid facelifts come in. Okay. But yes. before we do, before we do that, I think there's another question that you had mentioned to me <laughs> that you wanted to ask. Yes, uh, I wanted to ask because we know that uh, the liquid ones are, are uh, uh, an interesting role, but we often see, I've never done any surgic surgical ones, but what about the, the non-liquid, the surgical ones? Why are they not often uh, the, the right case? Uh, something that has changed over the years, right? We don't see yes. a lot of people. Okay, that's a fabulous question. Why are surgical face facelifts so often not the correct answer? The reason is, very simple. What happens is when, when, when medical science misperceived the problem of facial aging as just being like sagging and laxity, mm -hmm. they thought, well, sagging and laxity, the way to, to improve it is to stretch it, to pull it. So what they did is they went like this, boom, and they created faces that look what we call skeletonized which means it looked like skin pulled over bone. And the, what happens is the skin didn't have, really didn't have any more wrinkles and folds or, or you know, or, or jowls, but it did, the people didn't look normal. You could literally spot a person on the street and say, oh my God, he or she, they've been done. You know, they've been done. And that was like, that was like, a, almost like a curse to somebody. You spend all this fortune of money on a surgical facelift to walk down the street and somebody said, oh, he's been done. She's been done. I yeah. mean, that was, that was the killer phrase. Now, why was that wrong? Based on what we learned that 15 or so years ago about what I explained before about the, what's going on to the infrastructure of the skin, what we were essentially doing was we didn't understand that there was the loss of volume underneath the fabric of the skin. And we were simply taking the fabric of the skin and Especially. pulling it. And then what happens is this was a major operation. I mean, this was an expensive, it remains an expensive, aggressive operation that requires a, you know, a, a couple of weeks of downtime and at least six months to see any kind of real results until the the, you know, all the edema, the tissue fluid resolved, the bruising goes away. This was not a, a small consideration. And also the fact that a person is left with scars for the rest of his or her life, because the, the, even though they attempt to hide them in the hairline and behind the ear, then nonetheless, if you see it, you see the scars all the way around. And so there can be effects of the scars, there are all kinds of complications of scarring. So this was not a small step to take. But why was it wrong in the, why was it wrong so often in the first place? You know, had we known then what we know today, you know, what, what is it that, that, that changed? What changed is the following. I often use this example with, with my patients. And that is, imagine you have a beautiful, you have a beautiful dining room table and it takes three leaves to extend the, the, the table to its full length. And you really want to show it off to the guests at it, you know, at its best. So you get this gorgeous tablecloth to fit the extended table, and it, and this gorgeous tablecloth fits just so it hangs it hangs halfway around to the to the carpet all the way around, and it looks absolutely beautiful. And the guests are floored by it. Now the guests leave, and what do you do? You go and you take the three leaves of the out of out of the table. And now when you put, you put the table together and all of a sudden that beautifully fitted tablecloth is now hanging on the floor all the way around. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Take a scissor and walk around the tablecloth and cut it halfway down? Or do you simply put the leaves back into the table so the table can be restored to its prior magnificence? So that's what we were doing wrong. What we, by misperceiving when we saw all the hanging in the jowls and not understanding that it was a it was a matter of volume loss underneath in the fat layer in particular in loss of bone in loss of in loss of, of some muscular you know uh, uh, muscular tissue and we didn't understand that so what we did is we essentially 
we didn't understand that the leaves of the table had been taken out. So we took a scissor and we went around and we cut around the, we cut around the tablecloth and ruined it. Mm -hmm. And that's why that's why it was not the the correct. It, it is so often not the correct answer because it doesn't address the basic problem of volume loss with aging. It doesn't. It's it simply just is a trimming action to make the tablecloth flip fit without its leaves inside. Mm -hmm. So once we realized that it was a matter of restoring volume, that we could do easily with the various fillers that we were developing all along. Now mm -hmm. we were developing fillers to chase after wrinkles, but when we realized that volume was, was such a critical factor in the, in the cause of, this, of, the, of the aging process, the aging appearance process, we began to ma manufacture fillers that were more robust, that provided volume and lifting, and was specifically for augmenting this loss and replacing the volume deficit. Then, and it, they were not simply just to chase after a little line or a little wrinkle. Those kind of fillers still have their place and are still part of a total liquid facelift because. What happens is, as I said, after years of folding, you know, the muscles, you know, with, with expression a thousand, two thousand, three thousand times a day with laughing and scowling and quizzical looks and all kinds of things that you just did in a smile right now. The thing <laughs> is that what we needed something that could be put in very superficially to elevate and smooth those superficial lines, yeah. but to address the major causative factors. We now had these robust fillers and natural fillers, you see, natural hyaluronic acid based fillers, which are basically just complex sugar molecules that the body recognizes as natural because it's exactly like the hyaluronic acid that we're natural that naturally makes up about 50% of our tissues, you know, of our skin tissues. So the thing is that now we have these natural fillers that could restore volume and we didn't. It, it, we could do it non-surgically, just by injection. Hence the name liquid facelift. Yes. And you could, and the people could see the results immediately. When I to did. the point where, to the point where you could put up "Wow" in the mirror. I don't know if the people can see it, <laughs> but you could put up the word "Wow" oh. in the mirror <laughs> because the people, because you can restore the volume immediately, and the people could get the result on the spot yeah. they walk out literally they walk out literally with their result because like now, you said it's a, it's a matter of volume so if we have the filler coming in to to replace and to reestablish the volume the, the the result is instant so hopefully if you're in, in at home wondering about doing a, surg a surgical facelift please don't <laughs> uh, really look into uh, liquid uh, they are more like uh, dr novik is uh, as mentioned and they're really uh, more strategic in terms of uh, of the fillers and how long usually uh, they last and why are they so effective? Um, oh, okay, Dr. that's an excellent question. Because the because the fill, the volumizing fillers and the lifting fillers are natural, naturally they will be subject to you know to metabolic breakdown with you know within within the skin. Um, metabolic breakdown of, of fillers is subject to two major things. One uh, one is mecha the mechanical the mechanical uh, pressure of, of a certain area. Certain areas like under the eyes and the cheeks, even if you smile very, very hard, like try, if you try smiling very hard, you'll find there's not much pressure on this area. Certainly there's very little pressure on the thin skin underneath the eye. So mechanical pressure is, is, very, is very limited and plays a, a much, much smaller uh, role in the breakdown of the filler when you put it in, so that so that it's so that the filler is a natural filler is subject only to the end the natural enzyme that can break it down. Now mechanical breakdown is is a rather quick process. Mm -hmm. The enzymatic breakdown is a slow process. So in areas like the cheeks or under the eyes where there's not much mechanical pressure, the filler the volumizing and lifting fillers are subject to subject basically in large measure only to a very slow process 
of breakdown by the nat by natural enzyme hyaluronidase, the natural hyaluronidase. And that in the cheeks can take with the, with the volumizing fillers we have now up to two years. Wow. Okay. Underneath, if when placed underneath the eyes, because this is subject to so little pressure, I've, ha I've had patients that I show that, you know, that seven years after I did them, they still don't need um, any, any work. Um, so the that's thing quite is a lot, that, a lot of time. that's great. That's a lot of time. So, but on, but you know, for people who don't aren't outside the bell curve, it would not be unreasonable to say three years for underneath the eyes. Mm -hmm. So each individual area that's treated has its own. The chin, for example, if you need if you needed a chin augmentation with with a volumizing filler, um, is that can be that can be about a year and a half. Each individual area has its own. You know, depending upon the two major factors I just said. The degree to which it's subject to mechanical uh, mechanical pressure, mechanical breakdown, and the degree and the to which it's subject to the enzymatic breakdown, which is much slower. But fortunately, the cheeks, which is such a, which are such a, a central area and so and so pivotal in rejuvenating the face, that it, it, that it lasts at least a year and a half, to, you know, to two years. That's uh, and, and people are thrilled with that, and because it is natural and being broken down naturally. The underlying changes, which are still going on in bone and muscle and fat tissue, every year and a half or two years, you now can adjust the amounts and the positions to fit how the person is aging to do it best. It's not like a one size fits all, well, let's cut them and do it. And then that's the way they're stuck for the rest of the the you know, yeah. And the, un the other unfortunate thing was about the surgical facelift that I failed to mention is that while people are often told that they last, you know, for, you know, up to 10 years, most people are really lucky if they, if they see the effects even of that for about three to five years at the most. Wow. And yeah. since you can basically only repeat those, you know, a surgical procedure of that aggressive nature only about one more time in a lifetime, if you start having them at age, you know, 45, you're you're almost out of the game by 55. So the 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 very fact that you can fine tune anybody using the continuous the the continual use of of the volumizing and lifting fillers and matching it to how they're actually their bones and their fat and their muscle are aging is a tremendous advantage. Yes, okay. Yes. So not to mention the fact that there's little the little to no significant downtime after these procedures so that I had people I have people that, that come to me from all over the world and they get on their planes on the same day and when I did it when I did things like this for myself and under my eyes I, I took a, a 12 hour plane flight only six hours after I got after I uh, I treated myself so the thing is that these are things that th this is a significant advance in our understanding and a significant uh, advance in you know for patients because it's less expensive and the results are more, are the results tend to be immediate now i did you know i did want to mention that the second aspect of liquid facelift and that's something that people know about that's the, the overactivity of the muscle so how do we deal with that so that we don't you know so that we can sort of uh, retard the, the fine lines and crinkles, the, the crow's feet and the worry lines, the, the worry lines and the scowl lines and so forth. And that's with the use of neuromodulators, the most famous one being Botox. Again, it's a liquid that looks almost like plain, that looks exactly like plain water. And it's just injected. And usually within one to seven days, the object, the, you'll get the, the, the calming of those muscles so that they no longer overreact when a person expresses they don't they don't keep making oh, etching man. those creases into the skin and again since it's a liquid that can go under the rubric the umbrella of being a a, a liquid facelift and that's really uh, and and so those two aspects are together and they can actually be done and and, and most often uh, since I, I do have a lot of patients that come from way out of my tri-state area you know, and from all over the world, because of the logistics of travel, I often, I very often do both things, both treatments at the same time, all oh, treatments, wow. and that could be done 
because this is not something where they've gone under the knife and they have stitches and they're they're all bandaged up and they have to be in a, a hospital, you know, for yeah. you know a couple of days. This oh is a God. completely different kind of approach, and it really it, and the wow reaction is one that's phenomenally gratifying, not only to the patient but I assure you to the doctor. Yeah, <laughs> it's it much, really is much easier. And I often see a doctor is talking about thread lifts as well. Can they be used uh, with conjunction to liquid, or what? What are they, and how uh, how do they, they work they, together? Okay, I, let, let's backtrack for one second and, and ask whether there really is a real place for, for, uh, face, for thread lifts, okay? I was on the vanguard of using thread lifts back about, uh, you know, 20, 20 some odd years ago when, thread, when threads came out with permanent threads came out. And I was uh, beguiled, like, well, any other physician that got involved with it, I was beguiled by the by the belief that this was going to be long lasting and it was really a minimally invasive, no downtime procedure and it was going to last a long time. Well, unfortunately, even when using permanent thread, mm -hmm. none of those things, none of those things panned out. And so I gave up using threads altogether. Now, more recently in the past couple or three years, dissolvable threads yeah. have come into, into big vogue and are talking, uh, uh, being talked about. Now imagine this, just logically, if permanent threads didn't, didn't hold, you know, didn't hold for a significant duration, how could it be possible that dissolvable threads will do a bet necessarily a better job in giving uh, longevity to the... Um, so I'm going to read something here for you from a recent study, though, about dissolvable threads, the current trend. It's called longevity of barbed suture in, uh, insertion lift. That means thread lift. Uh, that uh, based on their review, the researchers found that all patients experienced improvement in, in facial uh, tissue dropping immediately after the suture placement and for one month afterwards. The, this improvement declined noticeably by six months and was absent by one year. Now, so it's not even lasting and not even lasting well for six One months, year. let alone a year. But wait, the overall complication rate was 34%, you know, what was 34% of the patients had complications, which included displacement of the sutures, meaning the sutures move, redness, infection, skin dimpling, temporary facial stiffness, and the authors of the study concluded, given this transient benefit and the complication rate of 34%, we recommend limiting this procedure to patients who are contraindicated to other, to other methods of facial you know, rejuvenation. Wow. So th I, I, that's a pretty bad eulogy for, for <laughs> thread lifts and why I wouldn't get involved with thread lifts or recommend anybody getting thread lifts you know, these days. Because, and one of the things is if you get a spitting out of the sutures, very often the, they have to be surgically cut out and that leaves a scar. So wow. it's not a logical thing, especially not in the day when we have, we have volumizing and, and, and robust volumizing and lifting fillers, which are doing that, which are natural and do their job underneath. Where, yes. they're the, where they're supposed to be doing it. And again, conceptually, thread lifting does not address the volume law. It was, a, it's again, even with all its negatives, it rationally is not even the proper approach because again, it's, all do, it's doing a pulling routine and it's really volumizing and lifting that's needed in, in the overwhelming majority of cases. Yeah, so definitely not a, an option anymore. <laughs> that's that's good to know. I would I wouldn't consider it an option, and that's why, even though I was actually one of the very first in all of the Northeast that was given, you know, was given a, the go ahead to be able to do thread lifting by, way back, and even did it on live television in front of you know an audience of about forty million viewers. I would not get involved in this in this dissolving thread lift, you know, trend. I learned my lesson. <laughs> yes, and, and I feel that's an important aspect of medicine. It's always evolving, and we need to adapt, right? And and not uh, not continue. Exactly. So, um, 
Now let's uh, let's uh, switch a little bit to uh, other types of treatments. As we, we know, we talked about, I've done lasers in the past, mostly for acne scarring. We had a whole video for acne scar. So if you haven't seen it yet, make sure to check it out. Um, about rejuvenation, a lot of people look for lasers and radio frequency uh, and microneedling for that as well. Do they, do they actually go deep enough to uh, bring back the volume that we talked about? Or uh, I know you're <laughs> uh, a little bit of, uh, <laughs> I really would like to know, uh, to hear from you because um, they're very popular. Yes, they are very, very popular, which, which is a great, re uh, reflects great on the on the power of marketing you know and advertising copy to sway people's thinking the unfortunately when it comes to fraxel lasers and radio frequency devices and ultrasound devices and now they've added a new new kit on the block they have acoustic waves i mean none of these really have and have real hard science to back them up they have they have basically enormous marketing and the science lags woefully behind the marketing hype. And if a person does his or her research properly, you know, the, the, and, and checks out the, you know, the, the sources, they would see how much displeasure, how, how many people complain of the, of the waste of time and the waste of money on yeah. these, on, on these expensive next, next big thing, bells and whistles devices. Now think about this. Each day, a new next big thing comes comes around. So let's logically think about it. If today today's next big thing is the next big thing, what <laughs> happened to yesterday's next big thing? Yeah. Why did it even need to be replaced if it was if it actually was the the next big thing? And why is every day a new device, whether it's radio frequency saying I'm better? Then fraxel laser and ultrasound saying I'm better than than radio frequency. There would be no need for another supposedly next big thing device, you know, uh, you know, laser or other energy de device to come about if the previous day's next big thing had indeed been God's gift to humanity. So yeah. by by the very virtue that every day another one is coming out, like I just mentioned, now the new thing is acoustic wave you know, to, to pound on the skin and to use sound waves to, to, to do tightening and, you know, and, and treat the skin. And I have a feeling that this next big thing is going to be as big as yesterday's next big thing when it came to Fraxels. I mean, and why is there so many, why are there so many different Fraxel devices, yeah. you know, Fraxel laser devices, because none of them are really proven, but they make great marketing hype because the, the public the, un the, the, the willing public is willing to listen to bells and whistles. That's what marketing is all about, swaying people's thinking. So yeah, that's, I'm that's trying to save people and I've been writing in my columns for ages. And whenever I do interviews, I bring up, do your due diligence when it comes to these things. A heavy, a heavy ton of, of buyer beware is necessary so that you don't waste time and my, and precious money on things that remain unproven and yeah. don't be beguiled by the by the, the phrase fda fda cleared that is not the same as fda approved mm. people see fda cleared that that they interpret that to be fda approved fda approved is used for medications that have gone through a 9 to 11, 12 year process of $100 million of R&D money to prove in multiple stages that it is both safe for human use and effective, and effective for the yeah. purpose for which it is, it, uh, which the company claims it's effective for. FDA cleared is for a device. And it simply means that after a year or two, they, the company simply has to show the FDA that the, that the device is safe for use in humans. It does not have to prove efficacy. So it can go straight to marketing and they can say FDA cleared, this next big thing device is yeah. FDA cleared. And immediately the, the, immediately the lay public puts these things that it has the FDA imprimatur, 
the same as for, for a medication, that it's gone through all this, you know, efficacy testing. It has not gone through efficacy testing. It has gone through safety testing. So it means that you could just be spending your money on something that just doesn't hurt you, but, 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 it's it, not but doesn't have the proof that it really helps you. Yes. So that's a very, very, very important thing for, for our viewers to bear in mind when they're doing their due diligence. To make sure, yes, that they, they go for proven and well-established uh, uh, procedures. And, and now on the other uh, aspect, and I know, and I'm a huge fan uh, of skincare, we have uh, sort of two uh, uh, ends to, the, to using actives topically. We have chemical peels, which depending on the concentration uh, uh, have to be done uh, uh, with a, a doctor. Uh, so I would love your, your take on that. And also we, we uh, uh, most of our viewers really like skincare and, and we, we use retinoids, AHAs, peptides. Uh, are the concentrations strong enough so we can actually see a long-term benefit? How, how long do we expect to see a benefit if we continue to apply? Because that's something we, uh, I feel like this is the first option when we start uh, this uh, rejuvenation process. Right, you're absolutely you're absolutely correct. So let, let's start with first what you know what the if, if there's a role for in in facial rejuvenation for chemical peels and let's say professional microneedling. The answer the answer is you have to keep in mind if you if you were if you were going to choose uh, let's say if you're buying tools and you had to choose between a screwdriver and a hammer, you have to know what your job is. If you have, to, if you have a screw and you need to screw it in, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think of using a hammer or vice versa. And so the thing is that you have to understand what, you know, let's, let's take microneedling. I love professional microneedling. I don't mean the home variety where the, the needles are not long enough and it's not done with a certain a level of, of the appropriate level of, of professional aggressivity to get the job done. Microneedling is, is for the purpose of if, if you have problems with the superficial part of the fabric of the skin, like sunspots and sun damage and roughness of the skin and little irregularities of the skin and very, very fine crinkling of the skin, that's an appropriate use. If you have Volume, if you have a volume underneath being the cause of jowls and laxity and smile folds and marionette lines, it will do absolutely nothing for okay. you. So it would be like asking the hammer to screw in the screw. <laughs> if you have a nail, the hammer is a good thing to hammer it in. You know, and you wouldn't think of using a screwdriver to do that job. And to ask professional microneedling, even professionally done, which is the which is the best way to have it done, having a a professional, a physician or a very trained, experienced professional doing aggressive microneedling, it's for the superficial fabric with color and textural irregularity. Now, when it comes to chemical peels, chemical peels, deep chemical peels, which I have to add, are done very, 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 very rarely these days, they can tighten the skin much the way that, that manual dermabrasion or auto or or device-driven uh, dermabrasion did years ago. Mm -hmm. Yes, it can be a skin tightener and that can tighten somewhat in, in the idea again of tightening the skin rather than replenishing volume. So you can see a, a effect and it certainly will give you an effect on superficial wrinkles and crin crinkles and crepiness, but they are dangerous insofar as they can lead to scarring they have a downtime about as long as surgery. If, if it's a deep, a deep peel, like a deep phenol peel, yeah. a phenol croton peel, those have, they can they have to be monitored for heart abnormalities during the procedure. It's a two week recovery time. You know, if this is a significant, this is equivalent basically to a surgical recuperation. Okay, and but and afterwards, all you're going to get is that tightening, pulling of the skin. Medium depth peels can also have their problem. And by the way, these medium and, and deep peels are, are especially uh, dangerous for people with skin of color because the people can end up with, with really bad hyperpigmentation or complete permanent loss of pigmentation with these wow. so that they have to be used with time. Unfortunately, very few people perform these peels any day. Now, superficial peels, like much like professional microneedling, superficial peels meaning high concentrations of glycolic or salicylic acid, 
something called Gessner solution or low concentrations of, of a chemical called TCA, trichloroacetic acid, can be useful for, for, for helping very superficial uh, fine lines and crepiness and sunspots and evening out of pigmentation and, and uh, texture of skin. But it won't do anything for replacing volume. And so therefore, it's, it's only, it can be done as an adjunct to the other things that we discussed if it's necessary. Now let's, let's go on then to what you asked about the, the at-home uh, preparation, the at-home prescriptions like, like uh, Retin-A or the uh, over-the-counter agents like Differin gel um, or, um, or even uh, uh, prescription strength for alpha hydroxy acids, you know, in 15% concentration, not the usual 5 or 10% that we found in OTC over-the-counter preparations. But even those are, are best reserved for being, for maintaining the skin after you've done other things that directly, that directly are, you're not going to get anywhere if you use it from now until kingdom come to take care of, you know, jowls and and deep wrinkles and folds and and the deep lines of the uh, of you know that that you got from ex the expression line, it's just not going to do anything, even if you use it from now and for and forever. But if you had these other you know liquid facelifts and the neuromodulators like Botox, etc., and you've now been corrected, you want to have some way of helping to maintain and prolong the results you've gotten. That would be the place of the religious use of, of these preparations, and usually in combination. Now, the ones that have been the most heavily tested are are product are the the retinoids mm -hmm. like uh, Retin A and uh, Adapalene mm -hmm. and uh, the Zaratine. These are these Pazirac. These are these have been heavily tested, and they have real science, and they have gotten their FDA approval approval. And um, the alpha hydroxy yeah. acids also have a long history, but although they're not, it, with not the same confirmatory evidence as with the retinoids, um, but still they, so of the categories that have really science to really substantiate it would be the retinoids first and then perhaps the alpha hydroxy acids afterwards. All the other new bells and whistles like growth factors and proteins and muscle, you know, acting, uh, you know, peptides. I mean, all of these, again, fall into next big thing mm -hmm. and lacks hard science. Yeah. So it's not worth the money spending on these additional ingredients, which just like hyaluronic acid, which is part of the liquid facelift when injected. So yeah. now they market it as part of your know, moisturizer. Like, why go for the injections if you can get the moisturizer? <laughs> yeah, well, I'll doesn't. tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because what happens is the people when you get when you're buying a hyaluronic acid, you know, uh, moisturizer, you're getting the stuff that sits on your skin, like any moisturizer. The a molecule of hyaluronic acid getting into the skin would have a, would have about as much chance as a railroad car getting into the opening of an anthill. <laughs> so you know. The thing is, it sits on your skin. You're paying extra for all these extra ingredients, but they remain unproven and unsubstantiated largely. Yeah. I mean, the science is not is not there. I mean, the jury is certainly out on those on those preparations. So stick with what's been with what has, has actually been tested, retinoid, and particularly the prescri prescription strength retinoid, and also alpha hydroxy acid. And those can help to maintain the uh, the skin. Now they're best used under the care of a physician because they are medication and they can yeah. have effects on people that have other conditions that may not be aware of it, and they can get they can run into all kinds of problems if they're self-prescribing. But that would that would actually apply to most anybody taking you know medications you know unsupervised. I mean you can run into all kinds of problems. So, but once you get on the regimen, it would be for a maintenance regimen, best to maintain the benefits that you get more dramatically by the other aspects of a liquid facelift. Combining them both is definitely uh, the strategic and, and optimal uh, 
uh, route. So absolutely, it's it's the way it's the way to maximize your investment. It's the best way so far to maximize your investment. You yeah. see, you're investing in your skin, and since there are two aspects, as I said, to the skin, all the volume aspects below, and the fabric of the skin outside. So if you if you treat the volume and the lifting issues, then you want to also treat the skin, and that can be done with you know that could be done in the ways that we said superficial chemical peels have been proven safe uh at home uh, treatments at home you know cream prescription cream particularly with alpha hydroxy acids and retinoids that's the way to go um but at least if there's any one take home message that i would like our viewers you know to, to come away with and that is that you know because everybody thinks you know when they think of when they see jowls and everything the old thinking, older than a 15 years or so ago, is that, oh, facelift, I need a facelift. And they stand in front of the mirror and they pull the skin <laughs> like this. And they look, and, and what happens is as they pull it, they should realize that this is the way they're gonna look. They're gonna look like something that landed from Mars. And you see, and, and not only that, the promises of how long those things are gonna last yeah. are not, they're really not justified. To go through such major surgery with potentials for complicate all kinds of complicate. If you think thread lifts have complication rate, think of what a certain an aggressive surgical facelift, yeah, where they're basically yeah. lifting your skin off your flesh underneath and then trimming it off the way you would be trimming off the that tablecloth example that I gave you earlier. I mean, this is this is something that in this day and age, when we have when we have a non-surgical quotes liquid facelift approach. To rejuvenating the the face, and it, it seems like the rational the rational way to go. The other thing is that we we have learned since that the earlier one starts these interventions, the the less likely they're going to ever need aggressive kinds of interventions later on, and yeah. the slower that the, it retards the rate of of deterioration as well. So now we've added another term to this. We call, when you start early, it's called prejuvenation. Wow. Because we are not just rejuvenating, which is sort of like you're know, trying to get the horse back in the barn, but now we're trying to keep the, the horse in the barn in the first place because it's a lot easier to do that than it is to go chasing after that horse to get him back. Yeah, absolutely. Prevention is, is key. Wow, Dr. Novik, uh, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, it was, I, I always learned so much with you. Uh, do, do you want to uh, wrap up, say anything else to our viewers? We, I am so grateful to have you. Well, I'd like to, first of all, I'd like to thank you for giving me the opportunity uh, and for give me, giving me this venue. I really appreciate that because, uh, you know, I've tried over many years, you know, with, with blogs and writing for various sites and everything to try to educate the, the consumer so that they're not sucked in by all the, the advertising and marketing hype, you know, yeah. that's out there, which inundates them. And especially, you know, the lay public is vulnerable to this, you know, because they're hurting from what they see in the mirror, what looks back at them in the mirror, and they're, and they looking, to, they're looking to grab on to any solution. But any solution is not, is not necessarily the best solution. Yeah. And there are fortunately simpler, simpler ways to achieve things that were not even to be dreamed about 20, 30 years ago by, by the so-called liquid facelift group. Yes, let's see what medicine <laughs> brings us in the next uh, that are, are going to take us to um, to more optimal and, and like you said, backed up by results. Uh, so, Dr. Novik, thank you again for the opportunity for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, we can uh, wait to have you back. So thank you so much again. And You're I'll very welcome you. and thank you for this opportunity. Bye bye. Thank you so much bye. for watching, everyone. Bye.